Okay, welcome to lecture number five, Photography as Art. And this is kind of an addendum to some of the things we've been talking about um, and a uh, jumping around a few chapters um, through one through five uh, in various places, but addressing some of the topics in photography that I find most interesting. So um, without further ado, Photography as an art or photography as a science? So early on, photography was labeled an art science. This was almost immediately as the new medium was found to be not wholly one or the other with the public. Its chemical processes and mechanical aspects relegated it often to the realm of science or at best uh, what one might term as craft. Though the process itself clearly arose from a desire for more perfect rendering of the natural world by artists, um, for instance, Niepce saw um, this new medium as a means for achieving uh, better lithographic reproduction. Um, and Daguerre simply had a desire to simplify painting and Talbot a desire to render nature without drawing. So the controversy over just how to categorize this new medium began as quickly as the process was announced to the world in 1839. So here we're looking at an early cartoon that's illustrating one view of the medium's new practitioners. And it says, quote, an artist, though you call yourself, you're but a clumsy cheat and only fit to take the mugs of loafers on the street. A fire plug or awning post or easy cellar door are all the pictures you can take. Don't try for any more. A number of prominent artistic and literary figures in European society felt that the new photographic technology should remain well outside the realm of art. Among these were Charles Baudelaire, the French poet, who felt that photography was detrimental to human imagination. Similarly, the painter Eugène Delacroix thought photography was not capable of expressing the complexities of human perception. And others felt that the finely rendered detail of this new medium left absolutely no room for imagination. So these opinions, however, did not stop artists from exploring the possibilities of the medium with a newfound vigor. And here's a quote, marveling at the new medium while debating its role in comparison to other high arts, such as painting. This uh, opinion was printed anonymously in the New Yorker in a discussion about the qualities and merits of the new medium. Okay, so here we're gonna look at photography's use as a documenter of fine art, or a means to document other forms of fine art. So many critics such as the famous British scholar and art historian, John Ruskin, had somewhat changing views on the new medium. At first, he called the daguerreotype a blessing and marveled at its beauty. He later then revised his opinion, saying, quote, as regards art, I wish it, the daguerreotype, had never been discovered. It will make the eye too fastidious to accept mere handling, end quote. He felt that photography would never express the personality and soul of the artist. Advocates of photography countered this, saying that it would improve public taste, especially in its ability to reproduce artworks, as we see above. So here we have Cherubini and his muse being rendered uh, through a daguerreotype. And you'll notice that you're seeing a reverse image because all daguerreotypes uh, rendered absolute uh, mirror-like views of what you were looking at. So the photographic medium began being used as a means to document existing artworks, uh, including personal collections of antiquities. Here we see 
an image that was included in William Henry Fox Talbot's Pencil of Nature, which is a reproduction of a bust, uh, presumably part of Fox Talbot's own collection. And here we see a reproduction of Hans Holbein's Dead Christ by a photographer named Adolf Braun. Adolf Braun was commissioned to document various works of art with this new medium, including the Dead Christ, as well as uh, some works that we'll be looking at shortly. Here, Leonida Caldesi in Italy is engaged in a massive project of fine art, fine art documentation. Here we have the sculpted head of a horse in a museum collection. So if you remember from last time, I, I talked about uh, Nedar, and here we have Honoré Daumier's satirical cartoon of Nedar raising photography to the height of art as he traverses uh, Paris in a balloon. Um, and this image is actually referring to um, a legal battle about the status of photography as a fine art in Paris. So the French studio, Meyer and Pearson, accused another studio in town of copying their celebrity photographs, claiming that these photographs were protected under French copyright laws. So in order to be protected, however, photography had to be declared an art by the courts. So the first court actually ruled against Meyer and Pearson, saying that photography was not an art form. But upon appeal, the courts reversed this ruling. So a group of French artists filed an appeal to this ruling in fear that photography's newfound status would become a threat to their livelihood. In 1862, André Desdéry published L'Art de la Photographie, which addressed the artistic aspects of the practice, uh, comparing it actually to a painter's brush. Desdary introduced what became known as the carte de visite, or visiting card, to the public in Paris in 1854. Images were made with a multi-lens camera on a single collodion wet plate. Uh, this is a process that I will discuss further in uh, lectures that are coming up. Um, so he utilized the wet plate collodion process, contacted, contact printed it onto albumin paper. Um, and then cut and mount the individual images onto cards. Uh, and these cards were about two and a quarter inches by four inches. Over time, uh, these cards became extremely popular and eventually Desdary was reported to be one of the richest photographers in the world. A competitor of Nadar's, uh, Desdary's mass production techniques spelled disaster for him and he opted to create more singular images. So he says, either you had to succumb or resign. So let's take a look at some artistic genres and their connections to the medium. In photography's earliest manifestations, the various genres of painting were applied, such as this example of a still life made by William Henry Fox Talbot. Uh, this was one of the plates included in his book, The Pencil of Nature, in 1842. Other artistic forms and applications were explored as well. A new art form was developed in 1839 that was called Cliché Vert, and this was created by British engravers. And it is, though not technically a photographic process, has some relationships to it. Um, it's a process in which an image is scratched into a smoked glass plate then printed onto photographically sensitized paper. So you know, it's part printmaking and part uh, photographic paper being used to create the image. Here's another example of a cliche vert. Looks very much like an etching in some ways. So though used by many artists of the day, including a number of the Barbizon painters, cliche vert enjoyed somewhat of a limited success. Adolf Braun was a textile designer turned artist slash photographer. He begins to do a series of images of floral still lifes that are intended to be copied to plates and printed as wallpaper. 
His floral studies were highly successful, and he later went on to photograph topographical scenes, works of art, and world monuments. And here's another image by Adolf Braun. This is a carbon print, and this is similar in some ways to the Woodbury type. So a carbon print is a photographic print that's produced by soaking carbon tissue into a dilute sensitizing solution of potassium dichromate. And the solution also contains some gelatin, carbon, and a coloring agent, or uh, typically a pigment of some sort. Uh, whereas a Woodbury type is uh, an image that's created using chromated gelatin film exposed under a photographic negative, uh, which then hardens in proportion to the amount of light. Um, it's then developed in hot water to remove the unexposed gelatin and then dried, and then relief pressed into a sheet of lead, uh, which allows it to become uh, reproduced uh, on an intaglio plate. So somewhat of a lengthy process, but one which typically yields a very detailed, very beautifully fine uh, tonal range in an image. Henri Lissac is another photographer who uh, I mentioned when we talked about the work of the Historical Monuments Commission in France. Um, and he also did a series of still life images. The still life was a popular form of painting for centuries, and it had been emulated in photographs from the very beginning, as we saw with Daguerre and Fox Talbot. One can see the stylistic similarity between Lesseq's still life series and popular still lifes of the same time period, as we see here by Raphael Peel. A very neutral background. It's very closely cropped, centered, focused primarily on textures and composition. And here's another Lesseq still life. And here's another one, photographic still life made by John Dillon Llewellyn. And here it became uh, somewhat of a common practice for um, artists to utilize photography as a means to aid their painting. Uh, so for instance, Karl Hahn, a German photographer, uh, had a very successful portrait studio in Munich. He also made images specifically for artists to use to aid them for their painting. An example of this would be um, a portrait artist such as Franz Lenbach here doing a portrait of Richard Wagner, the famous composer, is clearly working from a photograph. Now we can see some pretty clear differences between the photograph itself and the artist's rendering of the figure. And it may very well be that the uh, painter would, ha would indeed have the sitter come and sit for him as well and use the um, photograph in addition to having him sit for a few hours. So it was most likely a combination of things happening to achieve the desired result. Okay, I wanted to give a little bit of an art historical context to what uh, I'm going to be talking about in the next few images here. So let's talk a little bit about neoclassicism and romanticism. If we look at photography in the realm of fine art or high art during this era, the background that would be quite useful in understanding is that leading up to the invention of photography, the dominant style of art is known as neoclassicism. This falls roughly from the 18th century to uh, mid 19th century. And at the same time, but in contrast to neoclassicism, is the development of romanticism. So romanticism would include figures uh, such as Delacroix, Ang, um, also the Barbizon school landscapists, such as Millet and Corot, and realism of Courbet. And then in England, we have primarily the neoclassicism and romanticism represented through the work of J.N.W. Turner 
and the Pre-Raphaelites as well. So if we look a little bit at the history of painting here, neoclassicism and history painting, for instance, here's a, a very classic example of this, uh, Jacques-Louis David's The Oath of the Horatii. Um, and from, again, about uh, mid 18th to mid 19th century. So in many ways, uh, neoclassicism is a reaction to the Baroque. Baroque style being very dynamic and busy and lush. Neoclassicism, in contrast, sought to revive the ideals of the ancient Greek and Roman art. And neoclassical artists used classical forms to express their ideas about courage, sacrifice, and love of country. So there was very much a renewed interest in harmony and simplicity and proportion, ideas that gained momentum as the new science of archaeology was born. Uh, for instance, the discovery of Pompeii in 1748. So this stimulated a passion for all things of the ancient past. And David is one of the most famous and influential of the neoclassical history painters. Angelica Kaufmann, another neoclassical painter, was a very successful Swiss-Austrian painter whose reputation was very high amongst her fellow painters, especially Sir Joshua Reynolds. So to connect this with photography, as we saw with subjects of early photographs of architecture, the public taste was for classical scenery, picturesque ruins, the taste for objects of antiquity are evident here in Bayard's playful photograph of floating classical busts and sculptures with this kind of dark background to create this illusion of, of floating. Um, and as for the genre of history painting, some believe that the advent of photography profoundly changed this style. Now it was possible to see a photograph of the Queen of England or the Parthenon or other important historical locales. So this new medium somehow undermined the authority of the painting as a documentary tool. Here's a very stunning print by Gustave Le Gray reflecting the popular taste for architecture of antiquity while also capturing the dramatic play of light and shadow across the curved columns. So this is, I think, a very unique image in that it plays on the subject matter of these neoclassical images. However, it does it in a very uniquely photographic manner. In direct contrast to neoclassicism, romanticism arises as a popular style in art and literature. So this is a quote from the Met's uh, thematic essays on the Heilbrun timeline of art. So romanticism. It was first defined as an aesthetic in literary criticism around 1800. Its emphasis is on imagination and emotion. Romanticism emerges as a response to the disillusionment with, disillusionment with the Enlightenment values of reason and order in the aftermath of the French Revolution of 1789. It is a style that asserts the originality of the artist. It is visually often quite dramatic, displaying an awesome power of nature, of emotional extremes, of frenetic energy, of spectacle. So very much in contrast to the austere and more conservative treatment of perhaps even the same subject in a neoclassical painting. So if we then move on from Delacroix's La Liberté Guidon Le Peuple, we have a photograph here, which is a study for a Delacroix painting by Eugène de Rieux. And again, Delacroix wasn't, he did not feel strongly about photography's ability to be an art form in and of itself. However, he relied on it quite a bit for his own renderings, his own images in paint. Another artist that we can look to in the Romantic era would be Jericho. And here's the very famous Raft of the Medusa from 1819. 
Romanticist images are known for making the viewer participate very vicariously in the scene. And certainly the scale of these images contribute to, contributes to that idea as these this painting in particular is absolutely massive so that you have the sense of being literally the same scale as the figures in the painting. In England, we have J&W Turner, very well known for his powerful land and seascapes. His work displays a flair for the dramatic in their depiction of the meeting of sky, of sea, and of ship. And this is a quote from uh, Robert Hirsch's book, Seizing the Light, um, he says, the sublime, like a storm on the ocean, can trace its origins to awe, terror, and vastness. This image is also kind of uh, demonstrating the romantic predilection for pathos and violence. So now let's take a look on how these movements affected the new medium of photography and the explorations of it by new practitioners such as Gustave Le Gray. We've already seen how Le Gray documented the monuments of France for the Mission Heliographique and the Historical Monuments Commission. Here's another example of the kind of work that he undertook using photography. Notice the dramatic effects of the turbulent sea and dramatically lit sky and clouds. Exploring the dramatic effects of sunlight, of clouds, and water, Le Gray gained immediate recognition for his landmark photographs of the Mediterranean Sea and the English Channel. Uh, these were taken between 1855 and 1860. And at this time, photographic emulsions were not equally sensitive to all colors of the spectrum, making it quite impossible to achieve a proper exposure for both sea and sky within a single image. Thus, for many of his seascapes, Le Gray printed two negatives on a single sheet of paper, a technique called combination printing. One negative was taken of the water and the other of the sky. The overlap often appeared in such multiple negative images is not visible in this skillfully ex executed print. And here's the last image I'm going to show you. These images were all made using the wet plate collodion method of photography, a method that I will go into more detail in a future lecture. This is the end of part one of Photography and Art.